All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and get uh, started. So today's uh, is a dual session, um, part one and part two of the ABCs of starting a WISP. My name is Alex Phillips. I'm the CEO of High Speed Link. I'm also the immediate past president of WISPA. So the steps of becoming a WISP. Step one, you gotta join <laughs> WISPA, otherwise you will not make it. Um, you got to come to these shows so you can learn stuff. Uh, you need to engage in the mailing list, the WISPA mailing list, so that you can learn and ask questions and get information. And you must sell your soul to the FCC gods. Um, today's session, part one, we're going to talk about planning. Very important part of uh, starting a WISP is planning. My wife asks me sometimes, when are you going to go fix the sliding glass door? I said, I'm planning. I'm pl planning on it for two weeks. I don't want to get started and mess it up. Um, so that's a very important part of starting a WISP is planning. And then we're going to talk about um, basic operational setups. So, you know, it's more than just an antenna up in the air on a tower. There's a lot of stuff that goes into um, making a WISP work. Uh, part two after this session. Uh, we're going to have a speaker talk a little bit about taking your operation to the next level. So talking about maybe a few more little slightly advanced things that you want to consider. Um, we're also going to have uh, a presenter talk about mapping your network. Very important thing. Everybody needs to know that you've got to have maps, and everybody needs maps. The FCC likes your maps, everybody needs maps. And then uh, we're going to uh, you know, close it out with all the regulatory and compliance legal stuff that go along with uh, running a WISP operation, um, things that we didn't used to have to deal with, but now thanks to the federal government, we have good friends like John Allen here who will help us figure out what we ought to do to make the government happy. So let me go ahead and transfer this uh, over to our next speaker, which will be Nathan Stuke. Out of your way. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Alex. It's Ed, you know he asked people to raise their hand. It's amazing to see how many of you are thinking about starting a WISP, and uh, I'd have to say you've, you're at the right place to learn. Your your brain should hurt uh, by the time you get done with this week. There's so much knowledge that our group has, and uh, we're going to cover just a small amount of it. I, I think all of uh, our presenters, when we keep talking, we're like, how am I supposed to fit this into 15 minutes? You know, this is a, a two-hour session I normally give, or I could talk an hour at each one of my slides, or a day on each one of my slides. So we obviously can't cover everything. Uh, I'm going to do about 15 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A, a little bit of Q&A before we go on to the next uh, presenter. So uh, if you fail to plan, uh, you plan to fail. And, and there's a whole bunch of things that go into planning, and I'm going to try to talk about some of the key ones and some of the things that I wish I would have known when I was starting the WIST that I, I now know. So I always like to know a little bit about the speakers. Uh, my wife is from South Africa. Um, I got my MBA from Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. And uh, these are my three children uh, and my wife. Uh, another interesting fact is that I was on the US National Swim Team. So I swam 25 kilometers straight. Uh, that's 15 and a half miles. Um, and when I tell people that it took me five and a half hours to swim it, they think for a little bit. And they're like, wow, I don't do anything but sleep for five and a half hours straight. I said, yes, yes, I used to swim for five and a half hours straight. I had a blast doing it. Um, my wife and I came out of retirement. We'd been, prior, been retired for 15 years and got to go to the Masters World Championships in uh, Russia two years ago. And uh, that's where they combined the World Championships with the elite swimmers with uh, the Masters swimmers. And uh, I was clearly the fastest out of shape person in my, uh, my age group. Um, but we had a lot of fun. The kids got to ride on the bus with Olympians, people who have gold medals, world records, and they got to see what it was like to compete on the national level. And uh, now they're so motivated to swim. It, it's amazing to see what they're doing. A little bit about Whisper. We started back in October 2003. Uh, we have uh, almost 13,000 customers. And uh, the, the picture there, I'm not sure if you can see it, but the picture in the middle there, that is a fire truck. Uh, that's our temporary tower that we drive around. Uh, a WIS showed me yesterday their picture of their fire truck they've been using as a tower for, for four months, and that, that's awesome. Uh, on the side of it, it, instead of saying to protect and serve, it says to connect and serve. Uh, we also call it our packet pusher, packet bumper. So this is all those little things you do as a WIS just to get things going. 
So let's look a little bit into what if I only knew. If I only knew these things, I would have been able to start over and do things differently. And what I'm going to try to do is impart on you some knowledge that, yes, I'm going to tell you these things and you're going to say, oh, this is great, this is great. But until you get into that situation, uh, you, you probably won't realize exactly what we're talking about. But hopefully what happens is you'll get into that realization. You're like, oh, wait a minute, Nathan talked about that and, and I need to be cognitive of this and, and do something a little differently. So we're going to talk about the plan. Uh, we're going to talk about employees. Uh, we're going to talk about the financials. Uh, leadership and owning your own company and I'm gonna to try to do it all in 15 minutes so we'll see how we do that uh, but before we get into all that I, I love starting with this is that you define success all of you are getting ready to start this journey and uh, you needed to define your own success don't don't compare yourself to me don't compare yourself to other wis uh, don't compare yourself to someone else you need to determine what success is for you is it a thousand subscribers is it having 100,000 subscribers? Is it having very low subscribers that pay you a lot? Is it having whatever you define as success, if you define it, you will always be successful. If you let someone else define your success, you will always be chasing them, trying to live up to them. And I guarantee you won't be nearly as successful as you can be if you define your own success. So I challenge you to do that. So the plan, what was the plan? Well, when my former partner and I talked about it, it was to make money, lots of money, really fast right? Well, that was his plan. My plan was to provide great service to our customers. I was in it for the long haul. I wanted to help customers. I, I got a real big thrill out of providing service to customers that couldn't get it from anywhere else. Um, I, I'm willing to admit this. We had no business plan. We didn't even write stuff down on the back of a napkin, right? We were just talking about it, and he was my neighbor, and I could get high-speed internet at our house, cable and DSL, but we couldn't get anything at his office two miles away. We did six months worth of research, and I convinced my wife it was a good idea to put $36,000 across three of our credit cards, and everybody needed internet. Not back in 2003. Um, so it was an uphill battle, it was a struggle, and uh, long story short, I got my first paycheck three and a half years into starting the business. Now, formally, I was a good, or fortunately, I was a good programmer, so I could live off of kind of that programming, work for 90 hours in a week up in Chicago, and then come back to St. Louis and, and live off of that for a while, and then go back and rinse and repeat. So I think about why did we not have a business plan, and, and now that I have one, I look back, if I had had a business plan for my WISP, I probably wouldn't have gone into being a WISP, right? I mean, there were so many unknowns back in 2003. Our industry wasn't nearly as, as evolved as it, as it is now. And, and going back and looking at that, it, it probably helped us that we didn't have a business plan. Now, I have an 80-page one now because I use it to go to banks and, and to get financing. You need two to three to five pages at the very most, but you do need to put it in writing. There's something about putting it in writing that says, I am saying I'm going to do this or our company is going to do this. And it's very important that you take all those ideas you have and get them down on paper as to what you really want to do. So I would recommend that you have at least a two-page business plan that outlines what you're doing. Uh, the other thing I would like to say is I see so many businesses that are, they struggle because they're a partnership. I'm not saying partnerships don't work. I was fortunate enough to be able to buy out my partner and I still provide his internet and, and everything and he still lives next to me. Um, but really, partnerships are usually very hard. You, you, you're all singing kumbaya, everything sounds great, we're going to start this business, and then usually someone doesn't bring something to the table that they were supposed to, someone's working harder than the other, and I just caution you ahead of time that if you need to have a buy-sell agreement. Uh, that's part of the plan. If, if you have partners, it's how are we going to separate if things aren't going well? Oh, no, everything's going great. That's the perfect time to get your buy-sell agreement. They're bowler plates off of the internet. Uh, you can talk to a lawyer if you really have to, but having something in outline that says, well, this is how we're going to separate if we have to. For me, fortunately, I went into my partner and said, listen, I'm going to buy you or you're gonna buy me. Here's the price I evaluate the company at. If you want it, you need to pay me that much money. If you don't, I will pay you that much money. Now, I got very fortunate. I was the one running the business. He was a silent partner, and he said, that sounds like a fair price, and I was able to buy him out. But that isn't the way it always goes. So you really need to look into that. Employees. I thought every employee thought the way I did, right? I'm an owner. I take responsibility for my actions. I, I, I'm a self-starter. Um, not all your employees are that way, and the faster you realize that, the, the better off you'll be. doesn't mean they're bad employees. It's just they think differently than owners usually. Uh, the other thing is that management and being a leader is a choice. Um, I've had several managers that chose not to be a, a leader, chose not to be a manager. And, and I said, well, don't be mad at me when I choose not to make you my manager, right? Because you have to come in every day 
and have a choice. You have to make that choice that you want to be a manager. You have to make that choice to do the hard things. And you're the leader in your company. You're the one starting it. And you may be the only employee, and that's okay. But as you add employees, you have to understand that they're making a choice, and you have to let them know that they have to make the right one. Earn the respect of your employees. Um, I don't do anything that uh, I don't ask my employees to do anything I'm not willing to do. Is it better that I not climb a tower because I need to get other things done because I'm the only one that can talk to the bank or everything? Absolutely. But if it's 2 o'clock in the morning and none of my tower climbers are available, I, I will go climb a tower if I have to to get the customers back up. And that's how I earn the respect of our customers. Um, hire slow, fire fast. We, we used to do it a little differently. Uh, we would hire the first person that came in off the streets that didn't smell, and we're like, awesome, come on, work for us, we're dying, we need you, we need you. And then it would, wouldn't work out, and it would take us six months to find out they weren't the right employee, and then we'd have to start all over, and we were back again to, oh, we need an employee, hire the first person we can get in the door. We went so far as we would hire four people for two positions, knowing that two of them weren't going to work out, and that hopefully we'd be left with the two best ones. Uh, and it's, as you're, when you're small, it's really hard to say, well, I don't have time to spend on hiring. You need to spend a lot of time on hiring. You need to make sure you hire the right people that fit your, your, your corporation and, and the, the business you're trying to start. And that has to do with your core values and, and what you believe as a person, they need to fit into that. If they don't, even though they're the best person in the world, they'll be the wrong fit. So financials. Um, I like numbers, but I don't necessarily like financials. I like reading them, but I don't like having to do all the financial reporting. So you don't have to become an expert in financials, but you do need to know your numbers, right? If you have no idea what your numbers are, you are not going to be very successful. Um, avoid the temptation to grow too fast. Uh, Whisper's done this multiple times. We have so much opportunity. How do we keep up with it all? Well, let's just do it all. And then we wonder why we don't have the cash in the, in the bank to do different things because we're spending so much uh, money growing. So as a small uh, person starting up, uh, you have to be careful not to bite off a, hey, I've got a thousand uh, a house a subdivision I'm going to go deploy and I'm, I have to get all thousand of them serviced within the first month. Th those are some very hard things to do. Uh, even a profitable company can go bankrupt. Um, cash is king. If you can't make payroll next week, you have a problem. It doesn't matter how many assets you have. It doesn't matter how valuable your towers are. It doesn't matter how valuable all the equipment is. If you can't make uh, payroll the next week. So you need to plan your cash flow out. You need to, to have a budget. You need to spend time on it. It doesn't have to be down to the detail. It doesn't have to be uh, every little bit and piece, but you need to be able to work on that. And what happens a lot of times is as you're starting your business, you're too busy. If you're not into the financial side, you don't spend a lot of time on it, and then things start to slip, and you're not, you're not spending the time you need on it. I would highly encourage you to spend the time on the financial side uh, or get an outside person to help you where they help you uh, every couple hours, a uh, couple hours every month. The other thing is you cannot borrow your way out of debt. Uh, this is something that I, you know, you get your first loan to start, you get a little bit of equipment, and some people say, well, if I can just get, you know, a next loan, I can just get a next loan, you, you can't borrow your way out of debt. You really need to make sure your cash flow is, is where it needs to be by planning out how much you're going to charge. And if you're charging too little, increase your rates. That's something you might have to do. Uh, leadership. Leadership is a big one. Uh, lead by example. Again, I don't ask my employees to do anything I'm not willing to do. I also know that just like management, leadership is a choice. I have to come in every day, no matter if I've had a bad day, no matter if I'm tired because my kids are up, no matter what's going on, and I check my attitude at the door and make sure I have a good attitude because I am the one leading the company. And you have to know that corporate culture starts at the top. I, I didn't know this at first, and uh, I promise you, though, if you um, don't set the corporate culture, someone else is in your company, and it's probably the wrong one, wrong person. And I didn't know that. I didn't know that was my responsibility as CEO. I, I just was there until I put a plan together and said, no, I am responsible for corporate culture. I need people to think the way I do because I want the company to reflect me instead of having someone else uh, set the corporate culture. Uh, you guys have probably all heard about uh, the good to great. Uh, Jim Collins, he talks about the school bus. I don't like the school bus analogy really because right people, right seats. Yeah, but the only person doing any work on the bus is who? The bus driver. That doesn't work for me. I like the sailboat analogy. You're the captain of the sailboat. It is okay for you to go down and help them mop the, the floors, and it's okay for you to go down and help them raise the sail or go down and, and raise the anchor, but every time you're doing someone else's job, no one's leading your ship. No one's being the captain, and no one else can do that for you. So if you're the captain, go down into the trenches and help people, but know that you're responsible for actually leading and planning out where, where your company's going. 
Uh, another one that a lot of leaders struggle with is accepting that they don't know everything. They think they have to be the smartest person in the company. And, and my philosophy is, is, well, if I hired you to do something and you aren't smarter or better at it than me, then why did I hire you? Right? I want to hire really smart people, and I'm okay not knowing all the answers. I want to know enough to be able to challenge you and say, well, wait a minute, you know, is this right? Are you sure this is what's happening? And have you explained it to me and have me get it? Um, but I don't necessarily want to be the smartest person because that means it all defaults back to me to make the decisions. So owning your own company. Um, a lot of people say, well, I own a company. Well, do you own a company or do you own a job? Right? If you own a restaurant and a waitress calls in sick and you have to be the waitress, you own a job. If you own a car wash uh, company and you have to go out and wash cars because somebody's sick, you own a job. And jobs are the worst things to own because you can never leave them alone. You always have to be thinking about them. You always have to be doing something. So what I strive for is I always wanted to own my business. You say, well, you do. Yes, on paper, I own 100%. In reality, I own about 90%. There's still 10% of me it owns, right? I'm the only one in the company that can do it. I have to do this. I have to tell my no, I have to go to this meeting. I have to do something. So I've always worked to try to own my own business. And the way I say that is, could you walk away for one week? Could you walk away for a month? Could you walk away for a year and would it be more profitable than, than when you left? Now, as a small business, it's very hard to do that. So, wait a minute, I'm the only person here. There's only three of us. I can't walk away. You're absolutely right. But don't get mired in the trenches so much that you lose focus of what you're trying to do. And you want to build your way out of. I always joke with people that says, I'm, I'm trying to work myself out of a job. Right? I'm hiring you to do this so I don't have to do it anymore. And I kept thinking that was going to free up more of my time. And then I just found out there was an endless amount of things that I still needed to do as we grew. And the question really comes down to, are you working on your company or in your company? Right? If you're doing all the installs and you're doing everything and you just don't have time to work on your company, that, that's not the way you're going to go as far as you can. Will you be successful? Sure. Um, when I realized I was working more in my company than on, what I ended up doing was I had to schedule Thursdays were my work on the company day. I literally put it on my calendar and I felt horrible for doing it because I didn't put out any fires that day. I didn't solve any major problems I was having in the real world. All I did was think about my business and what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. But after doing it for a couple months and then seeing the benefit of how we implemented change and did different things, it was well worth my time to have it on my calendar that says, no, this is my day I get to work on the business. What do I want to do? What do I want to learn about? What do I want to do research about? So here's a couple sessions um, that, that we've picked out that are really good that are coming up at the show. Uh, we have the EOS operating system, the entrepreneurial operating system. That's the traction system. Um, I plug that one. I get to do that, uh, that session actually with Matt as well. So we'll both be up there talking about our businesses and how we, uh, we, we operate our, our business on the EOS system. Uh, we have a strategic planning one, help you prioritize. Right? Most WISC, the problem is they have too many opportunities and not enough cash and not enough uh, manpower to get them done. Uh, I'm also on this session, we're gonna talk about how you plan for that and how you can say, well, which one should I do? Which one should I not do? Key performance indicators. Uh, if you're not keeping score, you're just practicing. And I guarantee you every one of your competitors are not just practicing. Uh, this is a great panel. The speakers on here have done this a couple times for us and they do a really, really good job about how you should be tracking how well you're doing. Uh, effective managers, uh, you need them and how to be one uh, or create them. Uh, this is a very good one on HR, the people side. As you grow your organization, if you come from the technical side, you'll find that really you're going to end up managing people and you need to be able to manage them well. Finance, accounting 101 kind of speaks for itself, finance uh, 101 and budgeting and forecasting. So these are all great, great sessions that if you want to attend them, uh, to, to continue on learning about how to plan or how to do a, um, a financial model or, or deal with employees. These would be very good ones for you, uh, you to attend. Uh, and with that, uh, are there any questions? No, I didn't answer them all. Well, all we need is with one first question, and then they'll all come in. Right, so he says he has a business, an ISP in uh, Mexico. He's starting one in the U.S. because he's right on the border. What does he recommend as far as a, a corporate structure, LLC or C Corp or S Corp? Um, and I love answering it. It depends. Um, I'm, I'm a C Corp um, because I started 14 years ago. Uh, I also own a couple of LLCs. Uh, and really what you need to do is get with a tax accountant or your accountants and ask them, tell them what your goals are 
and what you want to get out of it. Are you going to have multiple people as partners? Um, what are the different ramifications? We have some tax code change that are coming up with the new administration that may make it more beneficial to be a C-Corp or more beneficial than it used to be. Um, so I would talk with some professionals locally to you and see what they would recommend. It's a very short talk usually, and you just tell them what your goals are, and they can recommend something to you. Yeah, I want to basically follow up from my own experiences regarding that. So that for, for me, when I started my business, uh, there was a lot of capital expenses. There was losses. There was things like that, and I had investors, family members. And so the LLC allowed me to you know, basically leverage the losses as much as possible. Um, but then later, uh, when profitability came, hallelujah, um, the CPA said, it's time for you to become an S-Corp. And so that's what it worked out. But, you know, like, like Nathan said, you should talk to your CPA, and they will give you the best advice, because none of us are. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Um, all right. So if there's no more questions from Nathan, I want to um, also say something to follow up on Nathan's statements. So um, Nathan and I have had this discussion many times. He and I run our businesses very differently. <laughs> but we always have the same goal, grow, make a lot of money, you know, provide good service. Um, the key, I think, to understanding the benefit of the wisdom of Nathan, because I do understand it and I do apply it in my life, is that, you know, how can you make these good habits work within your own company? And so doing it exactly the way Nathan does it every day may not be the exact way you want to do it, but you got to find a way for it to work in your life. It's sort of like a diet, right? If you don't stick to it, you're never going to lose weight. And so the diet has to fit your lifestyle. It's got to work as a part of your, your company's organization. So, you know, go to some of these sessions that, that Nathan recommended that are uh, really pertinent to this particular issue of starting a WISP and find how these good habits can uh, be put into your daily operation. Absolutely. Yep. Right. I, I get it. So his question is, is, yeah, what's the skill that would be the best for starting a WISP? And as our industry has grown, it's changed, right? When we first started, you had to be an engineer. Pretty darn close to it, right? You had to pick you had to out... A, you had to be a very technical person. Yeah, very yeah. technical yeah. person. Yeah. You had to pick out the pigtail. You had to pick out what power supply, what, what outdoor box you were going to put in. You manufactured the radios, and then you installed them for the customer, and then you had to keep it going. Now our ecosystems are such that you can buy equipment from multiple manufacturers and it kind of works out of the box. Yes, there's neat ways you can tweak and get things out of it, but the technical, the very deep technical knowledge has been helped with our industry maturing. Um, I think it comes down really for me and my and what I see that I deal with now. I have 72 employees and, and what I'm working with and in order to really scale, no matter what you do, you have to have employees. If you're a good people person, where you can get people to do things for you because they want to do them, not because you're checking over their back, not because you're mandating you have to follow these policies, you will be able to go very, very far. Um, even the smallest WISP needs one or two employees, three employees. And I didn't go into the Air Force because I didn't want to be managing people. I wanted to be working on computers. And now, 20 years later, I'm managing people and I love doing it. It's a challenge, but I, I love managing the people and getting the most out of them and taking somebody who didn't believe in themselves, let alone in what Whisper was doing, and training them up and giving them opportunities to learn and fail and, and do better and better. Uh, and I think that's what allowed Whisper to grow as fast as we have is because I have really, really good people. Um, but I don't find really, really good people all the time. We grow really, really good people. And that's what allowed us to really, really catapult past a lot of other WISPs that started about the same time the same time we were. Yep. Yep. So his question is if I'm looking for a new territory to expand my business, what would I what are my key things I'm looking for? Uh, I want a three thousand foot mountain with no trees on a flat plain and I am in heaven. Okay? So um, but I have the opposite of that. I have rolling hills, I have eighty foot trees, I have pine trees and everything like that. So I picked the region I lived in because I knew that. You know, the grass is always greener on the other side until you get over there and you find out they spray painted it. So you need to be careful with where you're trying to pick a region because if you're not intimately knowledgeable about with that region, the laws and the rules aren't so bad in the US because as long as we're following the FCC rules, you may run into a municipality that is kind of hard to deal with. You can't get on their water towers. 
Um, but at least in my experience, it's the terrain leads it. And honestly, it was like, I don't want to, when I first started, I don't want to drive four hours to my network. I want to drive out my back door and get to them. So we started locally where we were and then just kind of as the opportunity presented, now we cover most of Southern Illinois and, and working on cover most of Southern Missouri. So um, I think we're about out of time. I don't want to take yeah, up all Matt's time. I think it's so. time. Um, but I wanted to just follow up on that, that question. So another, another consideration, you know, anytime you're going into some new area is, you know, what is your potential? For revenue because that'll else that'll help you if you if you go in an area and you see you have a certain amount of potential that will help you then backtrack how can you attach yourself to that potential effectively you know so it kind of gives you the, the the ability to plan so it's just a starting point all right so matt is going to uh, carry on and talk about about some little more technical operational things thank you Great. matt all right yeah thank you nathan um so yeah uh I was sitting up here listening to Nathan and realized that uh, Nathan is uh, really a tough act to follow, but I'm just going to give it my best shot here. Um, so uh, all right, so yeah, um, while I'm introducing myself, I just want to put this list up. You guys can take a picture or, or take some notes on that. Um, these are the uh, upcoming sessions in the next couple days uh, that are related to what we'll be talking about uh, in my part of this session. Um, so. Uh, my name is Matt Wade, uh, founding partner uh, with at DC Access. Um, we are an urban WISP providing uh, wireless internet access uh, in neighborhoods in Washington, D.C. Um, and so just for some perspective, and I think it's a, a lot different than, than a lot of the, the WISPs that are here, um, you know, our uh, coverage area, most of our coverage area, population density is about, uh, or is as high as 25,000 households in one square mile. So uh, just uh, think about that a little bit. It uh, has a lot of opportunity, but there's also a lot of challenges uh, there as well. Um, so yeah, um, I get to uh, talk about uh, the fun stuff, the network setup. Um, so that's really cool. Um, and so, uh, you know, um, on this, on this slide, each and every one of these uh, slides, as Nathan was saying, I feel like could almost be its own full day uh, seminar. Um, but I'm just going to try to provide kind of a brief uh, overview, uh, and then we'll have a, a Q&A &A as well. Um, and so I'm going to show you some options uh, in each area, uh, and then also let you know uh, what we've decided to do and how we do it uh, at DC Access. So starting off with network topology, uh, thinking about that, um, I certainly am a firm believer uh, in the saying that uh, friends don't let friends bridge networks. Um, you know, for most of us, as we start up, you know, we're familiar with uh, local area networks and how they work, and you know, we kind of experiment a little bit and take that concept and move it outside. You know, put up some access points and get things connected, and hey, it works fine. So, you know, we we go on our merry way, and and it does work fine for a while uh, as we put a few few of the first customers on. But after a few hundred customers, you know, suddenly things start to collapse. Um, and that design really falls apart. And really the reason that that's falling apart is uh, because the whole network is bridged. Um, so, you know, I know here at the show, you know, there are gonna be some people that would say, you know, there are techn techniques uh, that can overcome that in a bridge network um, and can make a, a bridge network scale. And, and that may be true, but, but I would certainly recommend as you're starting a new uh, network uh, that, that you really want to start it off as routed. Um, you know, a routing network uh, not only offers scalability kind of out of the box, um, but it also offers flexibility. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is if it's configured right, really it can have some, uh, have redundancy built in, um, you know, from the get-go. Um, so once you decide to go uh, with routing, um, you know, there's uh, several protocols uh, from which to choose. Um, for my, what I recommend is for small to medium networks, and that means, you know, from zero to about 5,000 or so uh, customers, you know, we do recommend and we use OSPF uh, for our uh, routing technique um, or protocol. It is a, a standard uh, routing protocol. Uh, fairly simple to configure and get set up and, and get up and running pretty quickly. Um, you know, for larger networks, there are definitely other uh, types of protocols, um, but there are also 
techniques that you can use uh, to allow OSPF to scale even further than that. Um, you know, and and in this, I would also add one word of caution. You know, just like kind of stay away from bridge networks, you definitely want to stay away from uh, the older protocols uh, like RIP uh, for the routing protocol. Um, you know, and and just wanted to touch base a little bit uh, or uh, talk about a little bit about VLANs. Um, they definitely have a place uh, within network design. Um, you can certainly, if you've already gotten, you know off the ground uh, with a bridge network, uh, you can use them uh, to, to part of that transition to go from bridge to routed. Um, but they can also be used in a 100% routed network uh, on certain network segments, um, you know, in, in separating out uh, different areas of your network. So uh, the next slide is uh, on frequency selection. Um, you know, I've listed a few up here at the, the top level. Uh, this is not even all the lists that we have available to us uh, as WISPs now. Um, I just ran out of room on the slide, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, when we started uh, 2002, 2000, 2003, uh, really 2.4 gigahertz was really the only practical thing you could use. Um, and, and as I was putting this presentation together, I just realized, you know, I, I just can't even imagine uh, trying to do that today you know, a whole 100% uh, 2.4 gigahertz networks, and there's just no way we could do it uh, where we are in an urban area. Um, and, and as I talk about in a, in a little bit, we actually have already had to completely abandon that uh, due to interference. Um, so when evaluating what frequency, you've got a whole list of frequencies there. Um, you know, one uh, critical thing to think about is the environment. And what I mean by that is the environment, both uh, the physical environment and the radio frequency uh, environment. Um, you know, so for the physical side, you want to ask a few questions and, and kind of get a lay of the land. Um, are there a lot of trees uh, or are there few trees in the area where you're trying to to do this and, and what type of trees. It really does make a big difference on frequency selection. Um, another question would be, uh, as Nathan talked about, uh, what does the, the terrain look like? Is it flat? Uh, are there some hills? Is it mountainous? Um, you know, and also, as you're thinking about that, uh, what does the building topology look like? Are there uh, uniform small buildings, uniform large buildings, or is there a mix and match, that kind of thing? Um, so the, the last point on that uh, I would just say is that, you know, of these different frequencies, uh, the different frequencies uh, are better in uh, different areas. Um, so they're, each of them are kind of uh, good for one thing, but maybe not in another area. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I just want to talk a little bit about license versus unlicensed. Uh, for, for most WISPs that are just starting up, you know, license probably is not really a, a, an option because it can get very expensive. But I certainly would encourage you uh, to learn about uh, and then keep up with the trends on license technology. Um, there definitely uh, will be a, a, a use for it someday in your network, I, I would imagine, uh, as you grow uh, larger. Um, you know, we can also look at uh, frequency selection in light of point-to-point uh, -point versus point-to-multipoint. Um, you know, uh, I would highly encourage you to, to look at and, and develop a system where you use different frequency for point-to-point -point versus your point-to-multipoint. Um, you know, that'll allow uh, or, or eliminate or, or mitigate uh, self-interference. Um, you know, and just again, as an example, uh, we use the low band of five gigahertz for our point to multipoint, and we use the high band of five gigahertz for our point to point. Um, and then we're also for point to point starting to look at uh, uh, 60 gigahertz. Uh, we're testing that for our shorter point to point links. Um, and then we're hoping for uh, in the future to, to use the 11 gigahertz again for, for point to point. Um, and as I kind of touched on earlier, we're have totally abandoned 900 megahertz and 2.4 just because of the environment that we're in. Um, your, your mileage may vary on that. So the next slide uh, <clears throat> is vendor selection. Um, you know, different vendors have different uh, strengths and weaknesses. Um, each of them have a different 
uh, cost performance ratio. Um, you know, and again, as you're thinking and, and designing this, uh, you also want to think about um, if you've got uh, an embedded legacy network that, are, that you're adding to, uh, that makes a difference compared to if it's just a greenfield uh, you're going into and, and have the ability to, you know, your options are a little bit, uh, uh, you have a little bit more option there uh, for which vendor you use. Um, you know, when I look at vendor selection, I find it help, helpful also to think about and break down uh, point to point uh, versus wireless versus point to multi point wireless and core network. And so, um, you know, and your core network is the, that uh, physical uh, hardwired switches uh, and routers. And, and what I mean by that, thinking about each of those three, when I say that, uh, that we should, you, you should use uniform uh, vendor selection, it's, it's in each of those areas. And I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll kind of explain what I mean by that. Um, you know, and with point to multi point and point to point, do you use one vendor for point to, you could use one vendor for point to point and another vendor for point to multi point, or you could use the same vendor. For us, we do use the same vendor. We use uh, Ubiquity for all of our wireless. Um, and then uh, for your uh, core network, one thing you can kind of think about is, are you going to use standard protocols or are you going to use proprietary protocols? Um, and again, we use uh, standard protocols on that. Um, you know, I would highly encourage you to, uh, to do your research and once you've selected uh, your vendor, stick with them. You know, I've seen uh, quite a few <clears throat> networks that look like they've been built with the flavor of the month. Um, you know, and when you mix vendors uh, for the same job function, you know, say for instance, point to multi-point, you use several different vendors, you know, that becomes a lot more of a, a maintenance nightmare really in the future. You're just setting yourself up for, for trouble there. Um, so again, what we use is uh, Ubiquity for uh, the wireless and we use Microtik uh, for our core uh, network. So. Uh, Moving on to the network monitoring slide, uh, you know, and for network monitoring, there are certainly a lot of options. Um, but before we dive into those options, um, I think it would be helpful to think about uh, and make some uh, some fundamental decisions. Um, so again, I'm going to kind of walk through a few uh, questions or thoughts that that you can keep in the front of your mind. Um, you know, so monitoring systems are at their core really software systems, um, and so do you want to go with uh, an open source uh, solution, and that's going to be a much more of a uh, do-it-yourself kind of uh, scenario. Um, you could also do vendor-specific. So Microtik uh, has the Dude, Ubiquity has their own uh, monitoring system, uh, Cambium. Um, you know, if, if you're going to tie it to a vendor, you could do that. Or you could also do proprietary, where their proprietary uh, systems are going to give you a little bit more uh, support, uh, hopefully, um, you know, on that. Um, you know, and again, then another thing to think about is, uh, do you go with a standalone system? Um, and that's typically going to be uh, more specialized and specifically for monitoring. Or do you do go with an integrated solution that might pair it with billing? Um, and with that, uh, you know, when you, when you do an integrated solution, that might offer more information uh, to your tier one support, they can see into your network a little bit further. That gives them the ability to troubleshoot a little bit more. Um, another question you might want to consider is, you know, do you want a, a hosted solution? Uh, do you want to bring it in-house and, and have to uh, do that yourself? Uh, roll your own, basically, again. Um, and for us, you know, we've opted to go with the integrated solution, uh, a hosted solution. Uh, we do use uh, sonar for our billing uh, and network monitoring, and that is combined. Uh, you know, tier one uh, support staff can, can see that, uh, you know, when a customer uh, calls in. Um, I've got time for questions. Yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, I would just say uh, many of these vendors that we've talked about on this slide and, 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 uh, and previously here, uh, they're here at the show. Um, so I'd really encourage you uh, to take the opportunity uh, this week to go and talk to them in the exhibit hall. Um, so yeah, uh, questions and answers. <laughs> yeah, I would say, and I think that we can, 
all of us can answer this as well, but I would say there's really obviously two sides of it. There's the technology and there's the business side. And, and there's trade-offs on both. Um, and, and uh, you know, for us, we've made the decision that you know, we maybe don't want to go, we haven't gone with the most geeky technical uh, way of doing things. We've gone the integrated side, and so we've, we've made a business decision that we want to make it easier for you know, our frontline support. And so again, there's, there's trade-offs uh, in that area. I think what comes to mind for me is that, um, yes, I want to be a large WISP, so do I buy the system that supports 100,000 devices I'm going to monitor now when I have 13,000, or do I not? And usually the, the answer is no way I could afford that. So there is a bit of, well, you need to be able to use what you can right now at your price point. Uh, and and I, I, I caution you, though, is that when you install something temporarily, it becomes your permanent solution. It, it just always does. Well, yeah, we installed that like four years ago because it was only going to be a stopgap until we got this other thing rolling, and then, wow, we're still using it. So be careful think, telling yourself that, oh, we're just going to install this for the first year because after that we'll be able to afford the next bigger thing or whatever. You want to make sure that you break down your requirements into what the core things you need. I need to know when my network's up, I need to know when my network's down, and I need it to you know, notify me of that. Okay, all the rest of it might be great bells and whistles, but if that's not what your core is, you need to look at what you really need out of that system. If you're doing business level support, you may want it to do a lot more. You want tr graphs that shows you how well you've been providing the service, and that all just depends on, on who your customer is and what your business model is. So you, I think you need to make the decision based on what hardware platform you've chosen and, and how well you can, you can integrate that to your business plan and what you're trying to accomplish. Alex, did you have any? Well, I just was going to share my my experience with the monitoring. So when we first started our business, you know, the monitoring system was basic to tell us up, down, you know, just so I would know if something is down, I could go fix it. Um, and it was an out uh, open source system, and it did require you know the geeks to have to program <laughs> it. But um, and it wasn't a temporary decision. It was just you know when we started in 2000, it was what was available, That's right. yeah. and they've updated it. It's a program called Nagios. Um, but what I've found is that it gives me the ability to do special monitoring. So like, you know, uh, if I have a problem, instead of trying to go find a, a monitoring program that solves my problem, I can just go to my guys and say, okay, this is my problem, write a plug-in, plug it in. And then, so now I've got the special monitoring. So if it's, I want to monitor uptime, so if I have a router that reboots, I want to know. If I have a radio that reboots, it tells me, you know, and if I, if I see it happen a lot, then I know it's time to fix it. Um, if I have an Ethernet port that drops link rate, I want to know about it, and it tells me. Uh, or if I need to know if a business customer's ping times go or you know, latency goes to a certain level because they have quality of service that, I, that they're paying for, I can program that into a plugin. So you know, there's a lot of you know, pluses and minuses. So from the perspective of integration into your uh, customer management system for tech support, you know, Maybe they don't need to know all that stuff, so you know that's not important if that's if that's what your business model is. But for me, it was uh, you know the flexibility. So maybe we're talking about two different monitoring systems here, you know, one for tech support and one for you know all the rest of the stuff. Yep. Yeah. So the question is, uh, if you're starting up the Wisp. Uh, where would your focus be? Would it be more on the core or where we're putting the, you know, is that the question? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I would, a great question. I would say, you know, all of the above. It's, it's not a cop out, but it is all of the above because you, uh, again, you want to make sure that you've got, uh, and maybe first steps first. I would say go core first. You know, and that would be the first thing to, to make sure your foundation is, is solid uh, and, and roll out in one smaller area with the, the view of later on kind of expanding and, and kind of seeing where, uh, you know, the, the best locations would be for you. Uh, but, but you don't want to, uh, when we first started, you know, we were uh, in one neighborhood in, in D.C. and we were thinking, you know, five, ten years from now, we're going to be providing service everywhere. And, and that just 
didn't happen, and, and I'm glad it didn't happen because we've concentrated on where we are, and then we grew, we grew organically uh, the coverage area from there. Um, so, yeah. Uh, question back there? Yeah. So the question is, uh, you know, do you focus on residential or do you focus on business? Um, and we have, uh, from the very beginning, focused on residential. We are 90% residential uh, and the rest biz small businesses. Um, and, and that's just a, a way we've gone. Um, obviously, pros and cons to both sides. Um, you know, a, a few thoughts that come to mind really quickly is, you know, the, uh, on the residential side, you're probably going to have a little bit more hand-holding. Um, businesses, typically even uh, small to medium size, but certainly large businesses are going to have their own internal IT staff, so you don't necessarily have to, to provide that level of, of hand-holding. Um, but then on the downside of that is, you know, your equipment and, and network better be rock solid. Uh, you better have redundancy built in from the very beginning. Um, and so again, there is uh, pluses and minuses there. Um, you know, I think Nathan can probably talk to that a little bit more as well. Yeah, so when we started uh, 14 years ago, we wanted to be only business. They pay a lot more. Um, they are there the same hours that I want to do a service call. I don't have to wait for the person to be home and everything. And, and we, uh, we struggled to get into the market <laughs> And then I'm like, okay, well, I've got my MBA. I think we're going to do a marketing plan. You know, spend twenty thousand dollars to market our services, hmm, and hope it works. Or I could spend twenty thousand dollars on more equipment and go deploy in this neighborhood that I know is dying for service. Hmm, I think I'm going to do that. So we then became pretty much a, a residential only play. And residential is much much harder to get to work, right? You need a lot more employees to to keep up the volume. Um, but we did such a good job of the residential side that, well, everybody works somewhere. So when you start having problems at work, you're like, oh, you should call Whisper. I never have any problems. It's like, oh, well, you're not home all the time because I know we have problems. But, but you know, they, they were willing to go in and go to bat for us. So then we got pulled into businesses. And I know a lot of the WIS market now, there's a lot of WIS that are seeing their residential sales kind of taper off and flatten out a little bit. They're not growing quite as fast. You know, every month is not more and more. But they are picking up those business connections. And when we started, I thought everybody needed internet. That was not true. Now, you send people home because the internet goes down. Well, I know I have power and I know I have everything, but I can't do any work, so I'm going to send them home. So now these businesses, they're like, yeah, I'm paying two, three, four thousand dollars for my fiber connection at my office. I'm willing to pay you a thousand or two thousand for a backup connection. There's different things you can do. So I would build your network to support business and not miss on the opportunity to do residential. Um, because if you can build your network to support the SLAs and the things that businesses require, you have a really, really good network. And then you get to have fun growing your business instead of trying to band-aid it together and keep it together and everything as you, as you build out for the residential side. You know, let me, I want to add one more thing to that. I'm sorry I was adding. So, um, and this is, you know, there are probably business models out there where selling to businesses is uh, an, a, a viable option and you just decide that's the stress-free zone, so let's go there. But you're buying internet from a carrier and you've got internet access capacity 24 hours a day. Your businesses are gonna use it during the day and your residential users are gonna use it in the evening. Um, you're also, uh, you know, you'll have fewer business customers that pay you a lot. You lose two or three of them. It hurts. Um, residential customers, you lose two or three of them. You, you really don't lose any sleep over it. So, you know, it's, it's just good business sense to, you know, uh, spread it around. You know, sell the bandwidth during the day you got. And if you don't have users during the, at night, sell it at night. And so, you know, and, and it's just money. So just do it. So r real quick on that, we, we decided we wanted more business customers, more small business customers. So instead of charging them more just because you can, we actually charge them the same as residential. Because they use the... They use, oh, he charges them less is what he says. They use the same, they use the bandwidth during the day. So yes, our enterprise customers, we charge them a lot more. They want it dedicated. But you hit the nail on the head is I want to sell the bandwidth when I have it. And oh, wait a minute, I have it 24-7. Who uses it when? And that's why we switched. And now we sell them, a, they can do a premium uh, service package that says service level agreement that says we'll come out faster. That's how we make more money off a of small business. But generally it's, it's the same, same price, same plan, same speeds. Question right in the middle there. Right, yep. So uh, question is on expense. Uh, the 
cap initial capital expenditure and then also uh, ongoing uh, recurring what's the largest. Uh, for us, um, you know, starting up shoestring budget, I think a lot of people are in the same boat uh, on that, uh, you know, with established WIS and, and people that are going to be doing that, uh, you know, in your case as well, probably. Um, there are a few that uh, that do go out and, and raise capital first. We certainly did not do that. Um, and so our initial capital out, outlay, uh, although not huge, uh, was, you know, again, that core and the uh, putting things up on the tower, the equipment up on the tower, the uh, CPUs. Um, it was just me at that time, and there was no paycheck. So the capital, the uh, ongoing, uh, uh, you know, uh, expenses there was zero basically. Um, but then as we've uh, continued, um, you know, for us, uh, the um, Employee in expenses are, are by far the, the greatest. Um, and then second would be uh, the bandwidth, so. Yeah, and the, the one thing I'd say to that is I love recurring revenue. I hate recurring costs. So I worked very, very hard to minimize my recurring costs. So when my competitor was spending $16,000 a month to buy a fractional DS3, so 16 meg, I was putting in a 25 mile wireless shot to a data center where I could get the bandwidth for $7 a meg. So I worked very, very hard and thought out of the box. Now it's a commonplace people do that, but back when we were starting, it wasn't commonplace. You bought it from the phone company and you resold it to everybody in your area. I worked really, really hard to get my reoccurring costs down. We're on 360 some odd towers. We pay $23,000 a month to be on those towers. And if you count in the money that our tower owners pay us to be on their towers, we pay almost negative money. So that's, I just fought that and fought that and fought that and tried to manage it because it's all about cash. 100% agree. And, and quality of bandwidth, I think that's what you're talking about as well. Uh, not only the cost, but the quality. You've got to think about that, you know, especially if you're looking to go expand into other areas. Uh, what's the availability and what's the cost? Uh, um, and what's the quality? Uh, we're kind of lucky in the uh, in an urban area. We've got a lot of options um, and and fairly high quality options. Where you know out in uh, more rural areas, it's a little bit uh, more difficult. Yeah. Um, hold on one second. What are we doing? How are we doing on time? We're we're fine. Okay. Great. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So what's the most the question is what's the most value to work on the tower? Uh, the network or the client relationships? The asset for the WIS, if you want to sell it one time. Got it. So what's the, what's the value? Where's the value? Is it in the tower? Is it in the customer? Um, I'm actually going to defer to Nathan on this because <laughs> he's done a lot of deals. Uh, we've done a few, but uh, we've got an expert here. So we've done 23 acquisitions uh, since we started, anywhere from five customers up to 3,000, and we're working on a whole bunch more. Um, unfortunately, the, the honest truth is, is that we get no value for what we've built in the hardware side of things. Uh, there's still this mis, uh, misinformation about that our, our, our hardware doesn't last that long. You know, a fiber company puts in fiber and they typically get whatever the cost of putting it in for is what the value and it goes up from there. Uh, WIS, you put in all this hard work and all this uh, CapEx out there and then it's, it's very difficult to get value for that. The real value in WIS comes from the cash flow that you generate. So when you're creating what's called EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, taxes, and depreciation, that's a good way to determine how good are you operating, right? So we operate at a 50% EBITDA, which means that we're very, very efficient when a lot of other companies are operating at 25%. So it's a little different than gross profit. Um, but if somebody comes to buy you or you're wanting to position yourselves, Yes, having strategic assets as far as towers. Uh, that's usually why we come in and buy someone one. I don't like overbuilding other WISPs. There's, there's lots of opportunities out there. I'll go somewhere else. But I like buying them in my area because you're the more local guy than I am and you knew the tower owner that gave you a sweetheart deal to be up there or you knew the, the municipality that lets you on the water tower and those are very, very good assets. The problem is right now in our industry is you don't get a lot of quote unquote direct value for those. So really what you're doing is creating a cash flow. And if you have good cash flow, 
if I come in and offer you a rate that's too low, what you look at me and say, Nathan, you're offering me too little because I can pull that out of the company right now because I have good cash flow. The problem with it is if you don't create good cash flow, you're going to come to me and say, please buy me. I cannot make payroll next week. Uh, so the real big value in it is what are you doing to have that recurring revenue, that recurring cash flow that allows you to not have to sell, not need to be. So if somebody does come knocking, you can tell them, no, I, I want more or I think I'm valuable because of X, Y, Z. And they're like, well, yeah, you've got good cash flow and you do have some key strategic places. And, and now I can offer you a higher multiple. The one thing that I would add to that, and, and certainly that's, uh, uh, I 100% agree with that. That's That to me is, is basically the uh, ideal situation. Um, you know, other people think in terms of revenue only. So, and, and I would also say, you know, you can't think about tower as, you know, you're going to get money back out because of the equipment you put on or the tower that you put up. Um, it's the revenue that's being generated. So I guess this question is more, where do you invest your money, right? Where you have a pile of money, how do you invest your money to get the best bang for the buck? Well, it's kind of the chicken and the egg. Uh, if I don't have the access points on the towers, I can't provide the customers. If I don't have the potential customers, I shouldn't put the access point on the tower and, and those type of things. So when we grew, we went where the low hanging fruit was. Oh, I have a subdivision. We tried to pre-sell them. Oh, you have 20 houses. I need 15 of them to sign up before I go deploy. And we were always strapped with cash. So instead of us telling them, no, I can't get you service, it's gonna be six months until you get on my, it was, we'll get 15 people to sign up and we'll be there tomorrow because I need that revenue. And some of them, we even said, listen, it's gonna be $10,000 for us to sign, to do your install. You get me a check for 10,000. I don't care if it's 10 $1,000 checks. I don't care if two people write two $5,000 checks. Once I have that $10,000, I'll come deploy in your area. Uh, so that was a way for us not to choose where we were going to go. It was a way for us to have our customers, potential customers, the ones that were serious were the ones pulling out their checkbook going, absolutely. Um, so for us, the bigger thing to look at is if you don't build a solid network, if you go with the cheapest equipment, you will spend a lot of time spinning your wheels trying to keep the cheapest equipment working. You need to pick a, a, a manufacturer that has good, solid equipment so then you can spend your time growing your business not going back and doing service call after service call after service call, trying to keep your equipment running. All right, a couple questions over here. Right. Yep, yeah, great question. The question was, in an urban environment, you don't have subdivisions, so what is the model there? Um, and uh, two things jumped to my mind. Instead of subdivisions, we have buildings, and so we have condos and apartment buildings, and we go in, uh, and, and when we present to a multi-tenant unit, uh, one option is wholesale for the building. We have a minimum number, and typically it's 20 units uh, that need to sign up, and they can get a wholesale uh, deal, basically. And, and so that's going to, uh, you know, the revenue is going to be there uh, to, to have a return on investment fairly quickly. Um, the other... Uh, the other way that we do that uh, is, you know, we'll go in and do a retail. Uh, if it's within our uh, existing coverage, we'll still do, even for an individual in that building, we'll still we'll put in the system for the whole building. And even if it's only one individual, they pay retail, but we can back all that connection back out of there. Um, what we found uh, in the beginning uh, in an urban environment, again, we were looking, hey, we're going to be all over the place, so you know, why not just put this one building here? We've got a, a network of, of you know, five or six towers connected together, buildings connected together, and that's working well, but we've got this opportunity over here in another area, not connected, but okay, we're going to go ahead and do it. We found that that became a desert, basically. There wasn't enough uh, to, to support that. We had, we had to shut that down, and we don't do that anymore. We grow kind of on the edges uh, by going to these buildings uh, and, and you know, getting onto the buildings, and, and then we're able to, if they're within or on the edge of our coverage area, then we can broadcast out from that building again. One more question all the way in the back, and then we're gonna have to wrap it up. Uh, right, yeah. 
So you're talking about uh, contracts to the end user, end user contracts, yep. So the question is, uh, do you do end user contracts or do you not? Um, when we first began and even up to about five years ago, we did a year contract uh, that went month to month automatically. Um, we then decided uh, that, and again, we are doing residential, uh, and we decided that for the marketing bang for our buck, uh, it was much better to just, uh, we have a service agreement, a one-page service agreement that they need to sign, but it, there is no contract. The next month they could could be done with us um, without penalty. Uh, what we found is that even when we had a contract, we really weren't collecting that, that $25 or the $50 uh, termination fee anyway. Um, and so we, we saw much more value in the on the marketing side. And to be honest with you, we just don't have people uh, coming and going like that. Uh, once they have our service, they're gonna be there with us uh, unless, until they move, basically. Well, we saw contracts and, I, and I've got sort of a different philosophy about contracts myself. I, I feel like, um, you know, our contract is very simple. You, your deal is you pay, and our deal is we provide. If I don't provide, then you don't pay, and that's how it works. But uh, we always give customers the option to not have a contract, and they pay a little bit more. Because sometimes people are gun shy, like they just had a wireless service from their cell phone company in there. They see us as the same. So even though their neighbor said it was good, they were, they're kind of gun shy. So they'll take the no contract option to, to see, and then a month or two later they'll say, hey, I want to sign a contract so I can stop paying you extra $5. But I am still a strong believer in that commitment of contract, but it's really your marketing. You know, if you're in uh, a lot of competition and all your competition has no contract, well, good luck with the contracts. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, Provide good service and waive the con no, no contracts, and you'll probably have happy customers. Or even if you have that competition and they do have contracts, that's a differentiator, and that's where we are in an urban environment. Um, you know, that's just one of our key differentiators. My Did early termination fee is uh, whatever's left on the contract. Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, do we need to? Wrap it up. Or yeah, I think um, I appreciate this. Um, we're going to go ahead and oh, excuse me. We're going to go ahead and wrap up for now and take a break, and then we're going to reconvene at 4:30 for part two. That's right, 4:30. Yeah, 4:30. <laughs>